Okay, we are rolling. Okay. We're here in the conference room of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. on January 23rd, 2015. My name is John Hanrahan. We're here to interview Madeline Gold as part of the Lessons of the 60s Oral History Project. Filming this interview is uh, Paul Williams, and we're also joined here by other members of the Lessons of the 60s Project who might at some point uh, ask a question or two. Uh, before starting into the questions for Madeline, I wanted to take just a brief moment to uh, go into some of her uh, history, and then she'll obviously elaborate on that when she speaks. Uh, Madeline came to Washington, D.C. in 1967 in the era of President Johnson's Great Society programs to try to make a difference in terms of social programs for the poor. Over the course of her seven years in what was then the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, or you'll hear HEW has said a lot for those of you who don't remember it, and now known as Health and Human Services, she worked to develop more innovative uh, juvenile delinquency prevention programs, helped design and fund the first federal program for urban Native Americans, and worked in a special program designed to enhance the ability of minority and women's groups and communities to more successfully compete for HEW funds. More importantly for this project, Madeline was during her years in HEW an outspoken activist against the war in Vietnam within the federal bureaucracy, including helping to form government-wide anti-war organizations. She also launched an underground newspaper, The Advocate, that circulated widely throughout the department for five years, tackling issues ranging from treatment of minorities in HEW, effectiveness of HEW programs, and free speech rights for employee employees and helped and played an important role in activating a moribund local union in the department. Welcome, Madeline. Good to Thank you. get you here to talk about your Glad to be here. Impressive, very impressive record. Tell us a little about yourself, your background, where you came from and what caused you to come to Washington, D.C. Right. Well, um, I grew up near New York City in Long Island and, um, and I went to school in, in New York and got my, a degree in social work. Actually, at that time, there was community organization was a big thing. And, um, and so I actually got a social work degree in that. Um, and I spent a couple years working in New York City and uh, Philadelphia in, as a community organizer. Grassroots work, um, working with um, minority, low-income minority and um, ethnic communities on a whole range of, of issues. Um, but I also decided that I wanted to come to Washington, not so much, into, it wasn't really the anti-war stuff as much as a sort of a personal desire at that point um, to be part of the sort of the larger, you know, policy changes and I was excited about some of the things that were going on mm -hmm. that um, I felt like I really wanted to uh, come to Washington and, and be on the national level in terms of policy change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what drew me um, really mm -hmm. to Washington. I mean, I had done some work, you know, certainly in the civil rights, you know, civil rights movement. There were things that were going on. I, um, I didn't work in the South, but I participated in activities in New York City and, um, and had done some anti-war stuff. But it wasn't until Washington that I really, you know, got involved. And uh, just one little question before, uh, did, did you grow up in an activist kind of family or a family with a social conscience or? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, my parents were very socially minded. Mm -hmm. um, they they were not activists, but actually they were socialists. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I grew up in in an atmosphere that really promoted you know free thinking mm -hmm. and being active and speaking your mind and challenging things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but uh, of I probably am the only one of my sisters that really has gone you know in that direction. Mm -hmm. And, um, and even in high school, we, there were programs that I did in terms of going into New York City and working in some of the settlement houses. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that also got me more directly involved in issues around poverty. So. Can you repeat that last sentence, please? I'm sorry, I dropped my <laughs> I was saying that I, even in high school, I was, um, I was working in, um, with other students at my high school in terms of going into some of the settlement houses in, in uh, New York City and working with kids. Um, it was really more of re recreational activities, but mm -hmm. it really puts you face to face in terms of issues around poverty. Mm -hmm. and, um, and really 
reinforced my desire to want to do something in terms of issues around poverty um, and become a social worker. So in uh, coming to HEW, did you already have a, a job lined up when you came or did you come here sort of? Not oh, knowing what I was going there. to do. <laughs> no, um, I, I did have a job. I uh, was, um, I, I had a job at the Office of Juvenile Delinquency and Prevention, mm -hmm. which was um, part of HEW. Okay. And actually that program has subsequently moved to the Justice Department. That was after my time. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it was, um, a, I did have a job. I was a temporary though. I was, it was not a permanent uh, mm -hmm. position. And, um, but I had, it, was, it was an exciting program. You know, it was, I think that there was, it was very much part of the times, you know, that there were a lot of young people going to, into the federal government. Um, I mean, I think that sort of started a little bit, you know, certainly when JFK was president and then when, when uh, President Johnson started the, the um, Great Society programs, there was much more of an influx in terms mm -hmm. of young people with the kind of idealism that says, you know, I want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, w I want to see these programs really make a difference in terms of mm -hmm. poverty and helping low-income people. And, um, and so, like, I was, I was one of many people who yes. I think were sort of flooding into the government and saw federal service as a way of making a contribution. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but I did, I did come with, uh, with an actual job, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> even uh, if it was temporary. <laughs> and, and of course, besides the Great Society, the, the Vietnam War or the American War in Vietnam was uh, uh, raging. And had you been involved in any anti-war activities before you came to uh, Washington? Yeah, you know, not, not a lot. I was definitely, um, I was against the war, but I would say that I was not as, as engaged in that really, mm -hmm. before I came to Washington. And, mm -hmm. and actually, if I can lead a little bit further in that, I'd say that. So when I first got to HEW, I heard about the Thursday Discussion Group, <laughs> um, which had been started by Mike Tabor mm -hmm. um, in, in, in 1967. He started in 1967, in like, I think the spring or something. Mm -hmm. But um, my, my first encounter was to um, I heard about this discussion group that was being d d handled by employees, and I, and I went to it, and it was, you know, it was like a, an eye-opening experience. First place, there were other people talking so openly about, you know, what was going on in the government, what were some of the problems with some of the programs, and, and, um, and the need to educate and activate, mm -hmm. you know, people. And um, I thought, wow, these are my people! <laughs> Yeah, that must have been just really an experience to see. Think, I mean, if you think of a, you know, the state federal employee or something, this was anything but. Right. You know, it, you know that's that's so true. And I and again, I think that that was partly again who who was being who who were the young people that were coming mm -hmm. into the government. I, I think that they weren't prepared for what they were, you know, got in terms of the mm -hmm. influx of sort of activist-minded, you know, people, but. The, the Thursday's discussion group was a way in which I started to get active, um, you know, in, in my, in then, engaged uh, in activities. So uh, if, if you remember or want to, who are some of the other people in that group and how many of them are still around? Oh, Thursdays? you mean the Thursday discussion Thursday, group? Yeah, well, and then I'll get, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. And actually, I can't remember uh, um, who the names of the other folks were, but there was, well, Toby Moffat actually was one of them, mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, left um, over disagreements with some of the things that were happening. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a well-known, be right. became a well-known person at, mm -hmm. politically, and um, congressman and uh, what, I forget what other positions. Yes, and I'm, but in any case, so um, there was a group of people that were involved in making the decisions about um, who, who were coming to speak, and. And if you interview, hopefully you will, Mike, mm -hmm. um, apparently they did start, the first few of them were in a townhouse nearby. And they were actually, I'm not sure that this is totally true, invited to come in and have their meetings during lunchtime in, in, by somebody within HEW. I'm not sure that that's totally true. You have to check with Mike about that. But I was reading about it in an article about it, and some of the history of it. And, um, and so, uh, it, 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 again, it took place over lunchtime, and um, it was intended not to disrupt the regular activities, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it, was, it brought in some amazing speakers. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the full range of, of well-known um, 
administration officials, I mean secretaries and assistant mm -hmm. secretaries, and it wasn't just from HW, it would be people from, you know, from other departments as well, as well as um, well-known activists um, that were, uh, you know, like Mike Tiger and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and others, uh, Rennie Davis came mm -hmm. to speak, Kathy Wilkerson, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there were people who came, you know, came in to speak at the, over, over the time that I, you know, certainly was at HEW. And, and so through that you became more involved in what was going on in the anti-war movement. And, right. And then you also, uh, at what point you started a, your own newsletter right. within the department. Right. Well, um, actually, I mean, it, it uh, I think the first thing that I got involved in was this petition drive. But at, we were also talking about um, the, the idea of having, in a sense, our own underground paper, mm -hmm. um, you know, for HEW. Well, so don't jump ahead. The petition drive to uh, the first the thing. The petition yeah. drive against the war in Vietnam. Okay. Okay. So we, in six, we sort of started this effort in in '67. In truth, the advocates started about in a similar at a similar time. I mean, we our first issue was my, I have to just check my notes to make sure I know what the first issue was, but um, we, we did that in 68. Mm -hmm. And so really, um, they were happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. The development of this underground paper and the, um, and the petition drive against the war in Vietnam. So maybe mm -hmm. I'll talk a little bit about the, sure. the petition drive. Sure. You know, because that was, um, I mean, for me, it was, again, another eye-opening experience. You know, mm -hmm. and um, and maybe I'll just show if I can. This mm -hmm. was we passed out this 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 was a little petition, um, mm -hmm. the petition that we tra we passed out, and this went not just in H W. This was all over the government, mm -hmm. and um, and it was calling upon our chief executive to end the war in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and you can imagine what the experience was of federal employees directly. Um, you know, saying this to the government, to their mm -hmm. employer, that need, they needed to stop the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we, um, we passed around this petition. We really um, identified through various people. You know, it was who you knew. Uh, people knew mm -hmm. other people. Now, the, really, the, the, the four, it really started pr primarily with four, four guys, Mike Tabor, from HEW and Chuck Moran from HEW and Peter Skank from Library of Congress and Mike Ambrose from the Civil Service Commission. Hmm. And I was I became part of that leadership, but they had they were the original four who started the idea of this. And then I sort of joined that kind of later leadership group, but a little bit later. Hmm. And um, and so we we circulated this everywhere and you can imagine there was a lot of fear. A tremendous amount of fear. I mean, it was, oh, I can't sign that because the Hatch Act won't permit me to sign this. And um, and you have to. It was a whole process of educating people. You have a right to sign a petition. There are certain things that the Hatch Act did prohibit, like getting involved in you know partisan politics. But in terms of expressing your views, which included signing a petition, wearing buttons, you know, I mean, there are lots of things that people didn't realize or didn't want to accept that they mm -hmm. could do because there was such a fear about losing your job, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so it, 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 was, it was a great momentum that really eventually built for this. I mean, the more names we got and the more people talked about it and the more mm -hmm. people got educated, we signed, you know, people signed on to it. So in fact, what happened so that by, I think it was April, April 1st of 1968, we printed our first, the first of what would became two um, in, in the Washington Star. Actually, it was supposed to be in the Washington Post, but they made it so difficult for us in terms of what they were requiring that we decided we couldn't go with them. And the Washington Star was, at that time, no longer in existence, was much more uh, forthcoming and, and helpful for us. So actually, this is, this is the, um, this is the original, of the of it, and this this is about sixteen hundred names, um, and um, and actually by the time we finished with the with the petition drive, 
there was about 2,500 um, people, federal and employees. And this and was from across the this government. This was from yeah. 60 different ag federal agencies and programs. I mean, it was an enormous number, including people who were in, in foreign service. If you were in working for any agencies like the state or U.S. Department of Aid, aid and mm -hmm. any of those, you were prohibited from signing these. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there were people that did sign it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I, I can't quite remember, but I believe there were one or two that did end up knowingly mm -hmm. lose their job in this. And there were, for example, though, 50, 58 um, employees that went to their bosses and say, we want to sign this petition. And, they were refused, but they were trying to make a point, mm -hmm. and, um, and that did actually happen. So um, it was, uh, and there were even spaces in there, you'll see that have dot, 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 not the name of the person, right. but to indicate that somebody who was prohibited from signing could sign. How did you uh, get those forms around to people? How was, what was the method for that? Right, I mean, really it was identifying individuals in, all the, in many agencies who were willing to you know, talk to people at lunchtime, after work, mm -hmm. even during work, you know, pass, passing this around. I mean, it was a very, it was an easy uh, vehicle because uh, we printed so many of these things. Mm -hmm. And, but it was really by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there was, a, you know, a beginning number of people really who were, who were willing to take very clear leadership positions. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, um, it was a very, very mm -hmm. exciting. And so we, we came together and we um, printed this in the petition. The, I think like a day or two before we um, printed it, we had this huge meeting of, I think there were about 250 employees, which we thought was a pretty good. Yeah. And um, I.F. Stone came to speak to us um, and, uh, you know, just to bring people together and also talk about what comes next. Um, in terms of wanting to continue our efforts, both to, both to collect names on the petition and to think about, you know, continuing our work um, on the on the war. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we did. We presented. We had a press conference. We walked over to the White House. Of course, they didn't let us in, but we, you know, we handed petitions over to them, and um, you know, and it was. It, it really was an, a very, a very exciting event. And as I said, by the time we finished it, we had collected about 2,500 names. And during this process, we really did identify people who were willing to be leaders in various agencies to carry, you know, to carry on the work. And, um, and that's, what we, that's what we did. This uh, action is sort of unprecedented in history. I mean, there may have been labor organizing within right. the government but this sort of organizing against a policy, a, a horrible policy right. of the government uh, takes a lot of uh, uh, guts to do it. Right. Uh, it, 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 it was, um, you know, it was definitely an unprecedented event. I mean, mm -hmm. and actions, mm -hmm. you know, and it, there were times that you really got pushback from, you know, we would be outside and mm -hmm. talking, passing out leaflet, I mean, petitions and talking to people. And, you know, many of us were, um, you know, got some very rough comments from people. And some people got, had difficulty in terms of their bosses. Um, at that time, mm -hmm. when I was working in the juvenile delinquency program, um, my, not my immediate boss, but the head of the agency was absolutely apoplectic about my work on the, on the end war and just felt I was jeopardizing the program and just something I shouldn't be doing, even though I, everything I did, of course, was mm -hmm. on off hours. Um, and he did his best to try and get rid of me. He you know, gave me an unsatisfactory, even though he wasn't responsible for doing my evaluation. Mm -hmm. And it was only because I had some wonderful immediate bosses Mm -hmm. who came to bat for me mm -hmm. that um, I didn't end up, you know, losing my job. Did, did he ever and, personally confront you on it or he just sort of Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, ab he, he did. Mm -hmm. He did. He, he, he said, I, I'm, I'm determined to get you out of here. You were going to get out of here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, but I was actually saved by some wonderful people who came. And part of it is, you know, if you, do, you have to do your work. You have to yes. show that you're doing your work. And, um, and, but there were 
a lot of people who faced, who faced um, reprimands and, um, and difficulties from bosses who felt like, you know, if, if this is the way you feel um, on federal policy and you work for the government, you shouldn't be working for the government. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but so it was, it was a very incredible effort with a lot of very strong people who were willing to say, you know, I want to make the government better. And, uh, this, and, and really recognize that by going into the war, the funds, all the monies that were going into, you know, to pay for to kill people, mm -hmm. should be here back in the United States, helping to, you know, uh, help poverty and you mm -hmm. know, and, and make things better for low-income folks, uh, because of, of course, as we know, the tremendous amount of money that has to go mm -hmm. into a war effort, mm -hmm. and um, and that was part of what people, you know, addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The um, and so the advocate yeah, were the, starting. That was happening at the same. Time yes. Yes. And, but you have multi purposes for right. the, that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, as I said at the Thursday discussion group, it became sort of a focal point of like-minded folks, you know, talking to each other, and um, and we a number of us got together and, and felt like, you know, why don't we uh, use you know, do something like putting out a, you know a paper that we thought would be a way of um, getting our views more, getting our views out more broadly within HEW about both the war, but also about HEW programs. I mean, I think the more people talked, the more people felt disappointed about the fact that certain things were not working that they way that they wanted to work. And, and I think most, most of us were young. We were mid-level, you know, people with not a lot of power. We came in with all this idealism and then found that we were bucking up a lot of times against bosses who um, were somewhat entrenched. Um, that's not all, that's not the case in every situation, but it, it certainly, and just felt like things weren't moving in a dynamic way and that we needed to be more outspoken in terms of saying that, that HEW needs to be looking more critically at what it's doing and, um, and making some changes to make these programs better, whether we're talking about welfare programs or you know, health programs, you know, education programs, because that was part of it, you know, um, civil rights programs. And um, so we decided that maybe the way to do it was to do it in the paper. So actually, I'll mm -hmm. show you. This is, we, we, it came out in various forms for about really five years, more than we ever expected. <laughs> and um, this was, so I think that our first issue was in February of 68. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we did it all the way to 1972. Um, for the first number, three, at least three years, we, it, when it came out every month. And um, it sort of slowed a little bit later on. But um, it was a tremendous amount of work. But honestly, we had such great people who came forth to, uh, to work on The Advocate. And this is, this is actually mimeographed, <laughs> mm, that's which is, I mean, such old technology. So, you know, it's, you have to type out each page on a mimeograph form. If you make a mistake, you have to white it out and do it again. You, you put it on, th this becomes a, 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 like a template to put, a, a template is the wrong word, but anyway, you put it on a certain special machine to print out each page that you want. And um, typically, the advocate was about four to six pages. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we printed, we started out with 2,000 copies. Um, and uh, and we, we distributed it basically by people going on after hours and dropping it on people's desks. Mm -hmm. And um, is, that, is that the first issue? Or is no, that this is not the issue. Just, first issue. Uh, just for a sample, just tell us what are some of the articles in that oh, okay. particular issue. It might be. Right. You know, well, so this actually, this issue is a lot about the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, and it was around the Vietnam moratorium. Um, and uh, so it's, it was not actually totally typical. Um, but let me just see here. Of course, here I am. So here's, here's another issue, which actually was a, l a little bit better when we got a little bit more sophisticated in how we were printing it. And, um, and this was, uh, you know, the title here is Administration Attempts to Deny Employees' Right to Hear D.C. Candidates, 
Well, in this case, we were trying to set up a forum for people to hear the um, candidates who are running for um, the non-voting congressional seat mm -hmm. for Washington. And, um, and the other article is around um, actually arrests that were taking place in, in HEW when a group of, which I can talk about a little bit more, of HEW employees were trying to speak up around um, issues of, of racism and the lack of upward mobility for um, minorities in HEW. And that was a very big issue. That got to be a very, there was groups of, of uh, particularly black employees along with um, people who were on the advocate and in the union who really worked to try and address issues around racism. Um, so, um, and, and in fact, here was a letter that was sent to, at that time, Elliot Richardson, who was secretary, um, around the grievances that black employees had um, in, in HEW. Um, and so, and I'm trying to find, so other, other issues have addressed, um, you know, issues around the programs. Uh, this is around programs, for example, on that HEW funds for Appalachian, in, in the Appalachian area, and we had some programs, uh, some critique about some of the programs that were going on in, um, in what was being funded. Um, so it was, it really was a tremendous range. It was very hard hitting articles about, about what HEW programs, and not only just HEW programs. We would take on President Nixon, for example. We, we would critique his State of the Union message in terms of how it was, whether it was providing enough funding for HEW programs. When he came out for a whole new welfare reform program, um, we just tore it apart. You know, it was, and it was all public. There were, you know, it would be picked up by other pap by papers, actually the mainstream press sometimes, you know, in terms of things. But you, you can imagine, I mean, it, it drove the administration crazy. I mean, really crazy in terms of some of the things that we would do. But we, it was a tremendously popular paper in the, in, among the employees. I, I can imagine people even who didn't agree with you on the war, when they'd see it popping on their desk, they'd want to see, what are oh, they yeah. saying this time? And yes, uh, yes. And uh, we oh, did so have are we, a... Are we still running or...? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we did have a, a policy in, in the Advocate, which is that if we were printing an article in there, you had to be willing to put your name on it. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be anonymous. I mean, there may have been one or two times that we did that. Mm -hmm. But in general, it was, we've got to get over the fear of worried mm -hmm. about. I mean, you had to have the, the guts to be able to put your name on it mm -hmm. so that we encourage people to speak out. You know, if, and uh, so that all these articles had specific employees with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the articles had their names on it. And um, so it's very well known within the agency who was right. doing. Right, a a you know, absolutely. And um, so there was, you know, as I said, there was, it was tremendously popular. And t in fact, a lot of us who worked on The Advocate, and I would say there were probably somewhere between 60 and 80 people totally mm -hmm. who worked on The Advocate over the five years. I was probably the only person that worked, was on it as mm -hmm. sort of an editor or, or co-editor from, you know, the beginning to the end. But there were lots of people who, who worked on this. And we would get calls all the time that said, I didn't get my advocate. Where, where's my advocate? <laughs> and um, you know, we also encourage people. We never could print enough copies, so we encourage people to, um, you know, distribute, um, distribute, you know, the paper. And and I should say, take the opportunity to say that you know, even though this happened in H W, but over, over over the course of you know a year or two, two or three years, more. Um, agencies started to actually put their own papers together. Mm -hmm. So there was a very active, and this of course was still HEW, but NIH, NIMH moratorium com committee, which was of course not in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. They started their own newspaper called the Rainbow Sign, which um, if I have it here. Um, oh, yeah. And um, so, you know, and they did that. And there were a number of other agencies um, who also did their their own paper. We were probably the longest, you know, the, the longest in operation, but, you know, it, um, 
you know, it was definitely something that other, you know, other agencies mm -hmm. did, you know, did as well. Did, did you and others pay for this out of your own pockets, or how did? Uh, Let me do one more thing. Um, do you want me to continue? Uh, if you would pause one second, that would be great. Thanks. Sorry, this keeps coming around. So uh, okay. Am I? We are still rolling, and feel free to continue. Okay. I'm sorry, John. Say that again. Oh yeah. W did you uh, or another oh, pay, pay for, for this it. out of your own pockets, or how did you? Uh, uh, we asked for contributions, mm -hmm. and um, and actually, I would say for the most part, we got contrib people did contribute. I mean, it wasn't. We were just trying to cover the costs of the, um, you know, of the very basic costs. Although later on, as we got a little more sophisticated, we you know we had things printed like this. You know, this is one of our mm -hmm. later visions. So this this cost That's great. this tabloid cost a little bit. Um, you know more money, but you know we were we were able to generally speaking um, cover our cover our costs. But I I loved doing the advocate. I just felt it was it was um, for me it was a, a, again a, sort of a very very exciting and um, you know. Did Did you have information there saying if you have something you'd like to say or give us a tip on to contact you? I mean, were you in the line of fire so to speak if somebody wanted to? Say who's, who's, who should who's they seeking all these things? Yeah, yeah well, I, I think people, yes, I think people got to be known since all of our names were in the paper. Mm -hmm. People would come to some people and say, you know, you may want to write about this because I, th I think that this would be a good thing to come out. So, you know, we did have that. And certainly, um, in addition, because we covered a lot of employee related issues um, in terms of like the, the uh, around grievances around uh, you know upward mm -hmm. mobility and black employees in terms of racism and discrimination that was going on because at the same time there was also this um, uh, local 41 of the American Federation of Government Employees mm -hmm. was sort of we took over that all this sort of happened a lot at the same time in 68 60 you know so mm -hmm. um, and we got very close to some of the low, we, I mean, a lot of people were working with the low income, mm -hmm. the lower um, wage employees, like for example, in, in what was called central payroll. Mm -hmm. And um, and they would slip us information all the time about certain information around what was going on around pay issues or, um, and I can give you a good example. This is sort of a little later on, but, um, I, what year was this? Um, they were doing a bond drive, the U.S. bond drive, and um, this was happening all over, as you know, all over the government trying to get um, people to subscribe. Of course, we were arguing. We, we had a tremendous campaign about not buying bonds because the bonds went to, to pay for war. And um, a, not only HEW, but in some of the other agencies that we were working with. Um, also did sort of an anti-U.S. bond drive. And we found out through Central Payroll that um, Elliot Richards and some of the top people in HW did not buy U.S. bonds. <laughs> we played this up to the hilt. Oh, I mean, we had ad on the cover of Advocate, we, you know, we did this. It was the golden list of non-subscribers. <laughs> That's beautiful. And. Um, I mean, I, I, Norman knows this uh, because, you know, this is a really, I, when this came out in The Advocate, I was up on the fifth floor with the secretary's office. I walk out and there's Elliot Richardson and he takes one look at me and I, he says, Madeline, you have gone too far. This is absolutely too far. <laughs> and <laughs> so um, anyway. And we would, again, we would never have gotten that information, but, you know, we had people mm -hmm. who were in a, in a position to know. And so if we needed certain kinds of information, um, people would. You know who to we, go We to. knew where to go. Yeah, and to because we were also working with the, those employees to help in terms of issues around. Who were well, some of the other people on the, uh, the advocate? Do the various other names of oh, yeah. people who are still, yeah. So, um, well, um, Actually, Mike Tabor was on it at some point for a period of time, and there was a woman who started with me, Mary Ellen Sacco, and John Saunders, who was um, just fantastic. 
and um, Jeffrey Starkweather. I mean, there's just a lot, Beverly Wood, um, Betsy Erb. I mean, there were a lots, of, lots and lots of people who, Gary Grassel was a, a longtime, um, you know, member of the of the uh, advocate staff, and uh, David Knudsen, you know. So there, there were there were people, people who some people who were never active before. Um, I, don't, I think that that was really got to me at times. You know, people who came along so you know they were scared, but but felt that um, they had to, they wanted to step up and do something because they felt it was it was important to speak up and who cared who cared about what was going on in HEW in terms of the HEW programs and wanted to make things better mm -hmm. and um, and some of them joined the staff and, and worked in terms of helping to get the paper mm -hmm. out along with other you know anti-war activities mm -hmm. as well but you know that was that was a tremendous that took a lot of a lot of guts mm -hmm. you know to do that part of the uh, you mentioned of course a lot of pushback and part of it had to do with you even came under scrutiny of the FBI according to some little <laughs> right. uh, FOIA documents I have here and that did that doesn't come as never came as a surprise to you even at the time I assume you felt there was right yeah I didn't I didn't I, I didn't know so much about the FBI although it mm -hmm. was actually linked to I shouldn't say that it was linked to the what was called the Office of Internal Security mm -hmm. which was directly linked to the FBI and mm -hmm. there was an office uh, this office in HEW and they we knew that they were at a lot of our events um, and uh, and they were, they were definitely sort of working some of the administration, the higher level of administration officials in HEW, trying to get rid of people because mm -hmm. they felt they were such a, you know, a, a detriment to the agency mm -hmm. and to the, the government. And, um, and so we knew, we knew that, um, that that office was very active. Um, and, and actually, you know, at one point, um, I think it was probably about 1970. Um, I um, we had a, we had a I think it was a I can't remember whether it was an HW but I think it was Federal Employees for Peace might have been a, a demonstration on the Capitol, and um, and I was one of the speakers and I was speaking out against the Hatch Act and the needing the need to reform it, and at that time, I was the acting head of the Office of Indian Affairs. This is a tiny little advocacy office in the office of the secretary working on Native American um, affairs. I, it was a wonderful program. My boss left and I was the next, this white, young white woman was the next one in line. And so they put me in, as, or he put me in, really, as the um, acting, acting head until we could get somebody else who was actually Native American to take over the office. So there I was in this position and I went and they, the article, it was picked up with like, I don't know, with the front page of the post or something and it had my title as the, as the acting head of this office. And they got, the assistant secretary who was my boss got a, a call, I believe it was, I can't remember whether it was in Congress or the White House, and said, you, you, you get rid of this woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and make sure that, you know, she gets out of this position instantly. And um, so, and, uh, you know, and the internal, the Office of Internal Security was involved in all this, and, um, but actually I, it really worked because I've been trying to get this Native American guy to come into this position, and they were mm -hmm. delaying in doing so they got him in very quickly, <laughs> <laughs> so it was terrific. And, um, and then, um, but I have to say, I was very lucky. Um, the guy who was the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation really liked my work and and defended me and took me out felt like if he at least took me out of that position and sort of you mm -hmm. know that it would be okay but he said i'm not going to fire her mm -hmm. and um and this would have been about when what? i think this i think this was around 1971. Um, mm -hmm. this this fbi document just uh, just to give you your homage here. For, it says that this is the FBI saying a publication entitled The Advocate recently came to the attention of WFO Washington Field Office. This small newsletter is self-described as being independently printed 
by a group of health, education, oh, welfare sorry. employees and published monthly. Maybe I'm moving around and then too it much. calls attention to a, a meeting that's going to be held by that Thursday discussion group uh, from uh, the, the guests were going to be three uh, students from student activists from Montgomery County and it says this discussion group was attended by SAs meaning special agents unidentified at the meeting and then it says because of the sensitive nature of this investigation it was deemed advisable to attribute the information obtained from the meeting to a confidential source in the attached LHM I don't know what that is but anyway so they the sensitive matter you know, I know <laughs> You know, um, I, all of us knew that there were people that were around. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, so, you know, it's, uh, we were all willing to take those risks. And I think that, you know, because so many of us were young, we felt, well, if we lost our jobs, we would, we would go on from there and find, you know, other jobs. But we felt strongly enough about the work that we were doing obviously, so that we wanted to continue to do it. And um, I mean, not only were we very serious about it, it was also, I have to say, just a tremendous amount of fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, you're with people who you just, so much vitality and um, determination and creativity, and it was, um, it was mm -hmm. really a great thing. You had uh, referred to your union uh, organizing. Do you want to assume that's all is link to everything else you were doing. Really. Right, right. Yeah. Well, um, as I said, around the same time when all this anti-war stuff was happening, and a lot of the young people that were coming into the government um, were looking to see what kind of um, platforms, what, what, what would be good to use as a way in which to, to address a lot of issues, and um, especially some you know internal issues that people were facing in terms of problems around employment mm -hmm. and grievances and racism and um, and so in HEW we took over what I say was really a moribund um, union. Nothing much was happening and there was something in place. This was Local 41 of, of the uh, American Federation of Gover Government Employees mm -hmm. and, um, and so um, people used that as an opportunity to, to sort of force an election and bring a more activist leadership in. Now, I was, uh, I was part of that initial effort, but there were people like, really like Roy Morgan, who I wish was around to, for you to interview, but um, he's not. He, um, he's, uh, he, he really was the uh, inspiration and I think the guiding force um, in terms of doing that. He was the first president that took over, you know, once we took it over. And this happened in lots of different places around the government, it, around over those next several years. I mean, whether you're talking about, you know, Labor Department, Library mm -hmm. of Congress, um, and of course OEO, which was, you know, uh, but that, that had more of an activist base. I mean, there was just a tremendous number it, it, of people who were really coming activists, mm -hmm. who were coming in into the union movement, into the AFGE movement, mm -hmm. particularly at that time, or the international with their, and creating a different kind of, of um, locals in terms of a much more dynamic, willing to confront, willing to really fight for their, for workers' rights. And, um, and so it was, it was a very exciting. And I'd, I'd like to, as we have talked before, to bring some other folks together, maybe who were active in some of the other uh, agencies and really have something that we can talk about more specifically about what the union did. But it was, um, I mean, it had an impact on both, not only individual agencies, but on the international as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was, uh, you know, also a very exciting, you know, exciting time. And we, I can go into if you want some specifics, but we did. But we, um, we really, it was, there hadn't been a lot of organizing that had gone on. And when I say that in terms mm -hmm. of really um, getting, expanding the bargaining units, getting the right to actually negotiate a contract. And um, so that, none, that didn't exist. You know, that, that really didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and really signing up people when when the union came in, you um, even if you didn't have membership in a particular local, you were still responsible for addressing the individual needs, um, you know, of the of H, of you know federal employees. 
So, but you had to do the organizing work to really, if you wanted to build a base for these locals to be more, um, you know, stronger. And, uh, and so that's what Local 41 did. You know, we did, um, we really started to reach out into all parts of, of, of HEW, not only just the sort of downtown areas, but in some of the outlying um, parts of the agency and expand our, our base so that eventually covering about 11,000 um, employees. And, um, and then doing some uh, contract negotiations and you know, strengthening our grievance procedures and really going to bat for you know, employees and, um, and really defending and working with issues around upward mobility and uh, lower paid workers, but also any, anybody, just being more there to fight for employees' rights mm -hmm. if they were being um, really attacked by unfairly by their you know their bosses mm -hmm. and so it was um, it was definitely a, an exciting you know and and I became president of local 41 in 1972 so I sort of um, you know at that point I I worked more specifically around union issues till the time I left which was around 1974 you um, mentioned earlier and I didn't follow up on the federal employees for peace right. What, uh, <clears throat> what was that organization? What was your relationship to it? And was it involved in that ad or was that uh, separate right. from, from that? Right. Yeah. So um, right after the ad was finished uh, and we wanted to continue to some, some way of keeping the momentum that had happened um, and continue to do anti-war work, uh, we formed what was then first called Federal Employees for Democratic Society, FEDS. I thought that was a good enactment. Anachronism. Um, so we, um, th when I say we, this was also then people who were involved in from other agencies, other federal agencies. Lots of people came together and formed um, this organization to address um, not only anti-war issues, but other issues more broadly around policy issues. Um, and uh, so it was, in a sense, the same kind of thing that we were talking about that the advocate was interested in. Mm -hmm. There was an interest in terms of addressing um, a broader social policy questions, whether it was around mm -hmm. health issues or um, civil rights um, and uh, women's issues. And so the, but definitely also, you know, the war. So there was, um, the feds was, it, you know, really involved in terms of putting together some more issues in terms of anti-war. We did more rallies at that point. Um, we had quite a number of rallies in Lafayette Park. And, um, you know, in terms of bringing employees together, we had thousands of, you know, employees that really, you know, came together for when we would have um, some of our rallies at, at, uh, in Lafayette Park. When there was a the national demonstrations against the war. I assume you were there as a contingent. Uh, right, we so, were. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in May Day, for example, um, um, in 1971, um, actually this is, this was our, our brochure that we put together um, to give to other federal employees because it, you know, the May Day was the, that big rallies and big efforts where they were People were going to lay down um, on the streets and try and prevent people from going to work, and um, it was a it was a much more um, you know dramatic effort in terms of trying to stop business as usual, mm -hmm. and um, so it was that was a big step for federal employees to do. In the first place, we were asking people to take off from work. We were um, not necessarily asking them to lie down, but we were. In this brochure, we were trying to explain what was happening that day to, to let them know. And we held, initially, we held a, 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 um, a rally in Lafayette Park. Then the officials limited us in terms of, you know, how many people we could have, but the people stood on the, out, on the outskirts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then we, you know, that was, then we had the big, they had the big march. I'm trying to remember if I'm getting this right. Mm -hmm. Was that the big march, Norman, when we had the people um, on the wall when we, when we participated in that? And I'm trying to remember when that was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, no, 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 that was, that was a different rally. That was a different march. Mm -hmm. So we, we joined up 
we marched to the Capitol, and actually it was the first time we were attacked by police and, and on horseback. And um, it was a very difficult for a lot of some federal employees who had come there for the first time. I think we, you know, it was hard to keep people. Mm -hmm. uh, they were so frightened by what had happened. It was for all of us. It was mm -hmm. um, an experience that I think we'd never forget. But for we, I can even remember for some people who we talked to later who we were promised them things would be okay, and it wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was this big march on Washington when we had they had like a half a million people, and um, and we had like. You know, several thousand contingent of easily several thousand federal employees, mm -hmm. and actually, I was one of the speakers. Uh, you know, that day speaking for federal employees, mm -hmm. and um, so you know, there was definitely this momentum that was able to draw people, mm -hmm. you know, into some of these larger rallies. Were you or any of the other uh, uh, federal employees against the war was swept up in the thirteen thousand people that got arrested around May Day? Yes, I yeah. was one of them actually. Yeah. Yeah. They took you out to the stadium? To the armory. Armory. I think it was the armory. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Spent the night, mm -hmm. you know, there. And, and we, there were several of us who, who ended up um, mm -hmm. being arrested mm -hmm. during that event. Yeah. That was, several times I was arrested during, you know, different anti, anti war ex activities. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the federal employees for democratic society um, sort of morphed. Um, at some point into federal employees for peace. And um, I think part of it is that we had very grandiose plans of trying to really address a lots of issues and the war. And, and sometimes we found it difficult to continue to have, keep people involved and do that kind of work because people's commitments to their own jobs. And, and so we ended up sort of moving from that into more of an anti just at least keeping people together around the anti anti war activities, and so um, and and actually that's where I met Norman, my future husband, was at Federal Employees for Peace meeting at IPS because we were meeting at that right point. There. It wasn't in this building; it was in a, a different building. New Hampshire Avenue. New Hampshire yes. Avenue. Right. Um, but um, and then we we had some really. You know, very exciting things that happened uh, with FEPS, and um, and we again we continued to to do that. Um, you know, the the NIH NIMH moratorium committee had gotten Dr. Spock um, to speak at an event, which created a great deal of controversy. Um, but they that was a wonderful event that you know took place, and we had that would have been what year would that have been? All right, Norman. Uh, we think about it like 1971. Mm -hmm. so, Oh, 70? Yeah. yeah. 69, 70. No, no, it wasn't 69. I, I think it was later than that. And, um, but then, and in 19, um, what was it, 70, oh, we, we did the um, Ellsberg. Um, what was that? Yeah, that was 1971. Oh, when Ellsberg was, yeah. Yeah, so we, um, we did this tremendous thing. We, when Ellsberg was, um, you know, went through, you know, his own, the indictment and, and also all the, you know, the Pentagon Papers, we decided as federal employees we had to recognize him and, um, and do something to really, you know, play that up. So we decided to do this big award ceremony for him. And, um, and we, we brought people together to uh, have a dinner. We, um, we gave him a, a big, we made a big stamp that said declassified and handed th that to him. We also gave him, you know, we printed out a whole bunch of copies of this. And this is, this was a guiding principle, really, for a lot of us when we started. This, this was called the Code of Ethics of Government Service. I'm just going to read it because sure. I think it's so important. And, and it said, loyalty to highest moral principles and to country above loyalty to person, party, or government department. <laughs> they changed this, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this, we use this from our earliest days of anti-war work and advocacy work and everything because we took this to heart. Mm -hmm. This was an important code of ethics for government employees. Mm -hmm. And um, we printed a lot of those and, and handed them out you know, for the for the uh, this Ellsberg dinner that we had, we had um, 
I, I'm not sure you can get this, Paul, but this is Ellsberg speaking um, at our dinner. We had 900 people come to this dinner. We couldn't even accommodate everybody. We had to turn people away. These where, were all. Where was the dinner? It was at a restaurant called La Gemma, and it was. Um, I'm not sure it's exactly. Downtown, it was. Yeah. It was actually, I think, in the mm -hmm. Shaw area. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this was, you know, another picture of. Uh, this is Natasha Reddick, who was one of our. Um, MCs and our federal employees for Peace Banner, which is, you know, in the background. Actually, here's, here's another picture um, of Daniel Ellsberg speaking um, with the, the our, our flyer, I mean, our, our big banner, at the, you know, in back. But um, it was an amazing event. I mean, really, it was to have all those people come. I mean, we really, as I said, People flooded to this, mm -hmm. and they were. And Ellsberg, um, you know, started off by talking. I was going to be really sad about, you know, speak from you know all the hardship and everything. But I'm just like, I am so energized mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. you know all these federal employees who came, you know, to hear me speak, and and it was uh, it was an amazing event that you know Pep's Pep's put on. That's yeah, it was really great. Um, <laughs> Got a lot of lot of press coverage. Tremendous amount of press coverage on this, as you can well imagine. Yeah, and and for people who weren't familiar with that time who might look at this tape, I mean they will have to look up Daniel Ellsberg and, and Dr. <laughs> Spock, all these were polarizing figures to, to right. which the country condemning them, others supporting them in their anti war right. uh efforts. Right. right. And, yeah. And you know and Thinking about the Dr. Spock really leads me to uh, something I wanted to say about, and this goes to the advocate and the Thursday discussion group and a lot of these, is that when you said about you know, reprisals or everything, there were a number of times, many times actually, I have to say, that we sued the government over issues of our rights. I mean, when Mike Tagger was going to speak initially, I think it was, was in 1968, at the Thursday discussion group, you know, Mike, Mike Tabor got a, a thing, you, you will cancel this Thursday discussion, you are not allowed to hold this. And this Wilbur Cohen was the secretary of the department at that time. And we said, we're going we're gonna to hold this. And, mm -hmm. and we, we sued him to have the right to hold this meeting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and ACLU, God bless their soul. <laughs> I mean, I, one of many times they came to our um, aid in terms of you know, going to court. Ma many times we were able to get them to retract it before an actual decision was made because the government didn't want this to be a precedent. Um, but in this case, a three-judge panel actually ruled in our favor that this was an, you know, a, a First Amendment issue. And, um, and so the HEW backed off, you know, on it. And we went ahead and held, held this with Mike Tiger. Mike Tiger, of course, is an attorney. What was their specific objection to having Mike? He, he was an anti, he was a well-known anti-war activist at that time, and they did not want him on HEW, you know, on HEW soil. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it, it was held. There was another time when, this was actually, I think, later, later on, when we were passing out the advocate, and I think that for, for whatever reason at that point, the secretary felt that they had had enough of the advocate, and they told him we are not allowed to distribute the advocate anymore. And so John Saunders was actually arrested, um, um, passing out the advocate. And once again, you know, ACLU came to our, our aid in terms of, um, for, you know, protecting our right. We were to be able to do this on off-duty off hours. And, um, but that wasn't the only, there were really quite a number of times when we, we actually you know, sued, sued the secretary over um, issues of uh, constitutional issues. <laughs> um, they really loved us. <laughs> the, uh, um, well, but one of the uh, things with, with all of this work, you feel that your work and others in AF, AFG was effective in terms of changing conditions for employees, building a more vocal workforce, and having a more sustained activist leadership among the locals. Was that a 
and and how effective do you think then your anti-war uh, efforts uh, were too? And, uh, right. To expanding consciousness of and opposition. You know, I I think um, I think it certainly in terms of expanding consciousness and getting people involved and f feeling. Mm -hmm giving them the, the freedom to speak out on things that they cared about, whether it was the war or around their own programs and agencies. I felt like there was an atmosphere that was created that encouraged and enabled people to do that. Just, you know, over those years, so many more people got involved in, uh, in coming to either coming to rallies or involved in their own agencies about going to their own discussion groups, and there were many agencies that formed their own discussion groups, or participating in the, in the um, in some of the newspapers that underground papers that people put out um, I would you know I and I it's hard to say in some ways around the issue the, the, the on, on the issues of programs um, mm -hmm. and policy I think that we did make some differences on certain things but um, I would say in, in all honesty over the long term it was feeling a lot of a lot of us who came in at that time left the mm -hmm. government. Uh, you know, starting I would say around 1974, a lot of people left the government. That's of, when you left. Uh, yeah, out of feeling of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and feeling like um, it, it didn't, we, we weren't able to make enough of a difference about things and feeling like um, we were losing, um, we were losing some of the things, that, the, the steam that we had in terms of, of making a difference. And, and when people started to leave, you lose, you lose that cadre of people who are, mm -hmm. you know, are part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I would say during those years, there was a tremendous amount of mm -hmm. momentum because I think that people did stay together. Mm -hmm. But when people start to drift off, it, mm -hmm. it made a difference in terms of losing some, some of that. Did, um, did you have a sense that being an activist or other activists, it, it hurt them in any way as far as their own careers thereafter right. and what did you go on to do after 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 you left the federal government um, you know I um, I I think in, in many ways um, people uh, of the people that I knew I have to say did not necessarily suffer I mean people were not did not necessarily get advancement were not necessarily chosen to be uh, sort of a higher level. But in some cases, I was actually asked whether it's because they were trying to pull me out of, co-op me away from the union, um, to take on a higher level position that would have taken me out of the bargaining unit. And I refused to do it because mm -hmm. I wanted to stay in the bargaining mm -hmm. unit. Um, but um, I, think, I think really what happened a lot of times was that people left the government to get either jobs that they felt like can, they can make more of a contribution. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure that I really feel that, that I even know in, or remember, I should say, really, in terms of some, what happened mm -hmm. to a lot of people in terms of their own specific mm -hmm. you know, job, um, job situations. Um, but I think a lot of it was that so many people left and went on to do other things and did not stay, in fact, did not stay in the government. And, um, and I, I left, um, when I left, I, was, um, I went off to a trip in China <laughs> with um, the Guardian at that time. Um, and uh, that made a big, you know, I was very influenced by a lot of that and came back to do a lot of speaking around that. But um, I, um, I went on to do some really, even though I, I should say I came, I went on to do work that was, there was a, a big movement in terms of going into workplace organizing, and I went on to do work that was in a hospital and into a paper plant um, mm -hmm. for about two and a half, well, I mean, a year and a half to two years. Mm -hmm. I had these um, jobs to do specifically organizing, um, both with healthcare workers and then with, uh, in my paper plant, uh, particularly around issues of health and safety. Mm -hmm. And um, and then at, and then I left doing that. I, I got into a situation where I was doing some very health-wise, some dangerous stuff, and I felt mm -hmm. that I had to, mm -hmm. you know, had to leave. But I um, eventually I I um, I did go back to the government for a period of time um, in HUD in the Department of Housing and Urban Development, 
um, and, um, but left that too. Um, and I retired uh, in 2006 having worked for um, the Service Employees International Union, mm -hmm. um, doing, uh, working in their legislative office and, and lobbying on health care issues. Mm -hmm. and, and before that with the National Association of Social Workers. So I spent sort of the last mm -hmm. 16 years doing uh, that kind of work. Mm -hmm. But I continue to do, I don't know whether I should, you know, d talk about, but I, you know, I, I really feel like my whole life I've been, I've been an activist. And um, it, it, various kinds of things, I went on to do a lot of work around anti-nuclear war issues and safe energy. And, um, and then after Norman and I got married and we moved to Prince George's County, we were very active in our town, and um, in fact, mm -hmm. have for the last 10 years been um, ha helped to form a, a grassroots, very local um, organization called Progressive Chevrolet that continues to stay. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, one last thing, you, uh, I think we talked about this informally before, but uh, given all that activism today, and there's certainly plenty of issues that federal employees could rise up against today, you think the atmosphere is just different, uh, that would make that much harder, much, what the things like insider threat programs and things of that uh, sort right. directed at federal employees? You know, I can only imagine that it's yeah. much worse. Yeah. You know, that surveillance, I mean, you know, you just have to talk about the issue of surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, we, th we thought it was bad then and, and, and people had no idea how much there was in terms of FBI and surveillance, but we know now it's it's you know it's much worse, and um, and I think that there is a would be a much quicker crackdown mm -hmm. in terms of people speaking out. That atmosphere was part of the times, I mm -hmm. think, you know really, in terms of what I said about the Great Society programs and sort of who came into the federal government at this time, and uh, at that time, and I I just feel like. More than likely, you could you could never do at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say never because we were just talking about the that man at at, um, at EPA, EPA yeah. who has um, has had a paper. But I I think in terms of the level of organizing that we mm -hmm. would did did I would be very surprised if um, if you could do that. Let me ask Norman or uh, or Ann Gallivan if they have any thing they'd like to. Chime in on. <laughs> well, I, I just on the, uh, this is Norman, and just on the very last point that you were talking about, I think you're right from the context of the way the government functions now, but I think a lot of what is possible depends a lot on what's also happening in the larger society. And back at that time in the late 60s and the early right. 70s, there was so much ferment throughout the society around right. the war and on other issues that it created conditions. That, that this was possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think without that, you're, not gonna, you're certainly not going to see something happen within the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I think that that's true. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And overall, then, you think uh, you and the others, though, made a difference? I guess I sort of asked that in one other way, but that it, yeah. it was. Uh, I, I absolutely <laughs> do feel we made a difference. and. Mm -hmm. One of the things I feel very strongly about, John, was the issue of it brought people together. It brought people in to be as activists who had not thought about being, uh, who, who, who hadn't had the courage, or, or not even the courage, just it, it's in an atmosphere where they felt safe enough even with other people to, sp to speak mm -hmm. out. I think the proudest thing I feel in many ways is that there are a lot of people who were drawn into activities around Federal Employees for Peace or Federal Employees for Democratic Society or The Advocate and, and became activists and continued their activism, yeah. you know, and became activists for life. Mm -hmm. And um, when they didn't think that they, they ever could do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there were a lot of people who did that. So even though they may have chose to leave the government, mm -hmm. they continued in other ways. In, in whether it's in their own personal time or with other, you know, other work that they did, to um, and their whole value system, which affects the, how they mm -hmm. raise their kids, 
um, in terms of being able to speak out and uh, on issues that are of importance. I do promise you this this, this last question. No, no, you, it's said okay. it, you said it early in the interview about the, the, the strong belief of the times and I still believe it today, obviously, that the federal government could do things that made a difference in people's lives. Then we had the Reagan and all the, then the lowered expectations, Democrats buy into a lot of that stuff too. Uh, that, that was part of the, uh, the thing that, I mean, without saying we old timers knew what was best, but that's sort of lacking today too, that feeling that the government can really do positive things. Um. I, you know, I'm not, not in by the, me, but by no, <laughs> I'm not. You know, I'm I'm not in the government right now, so it's, in some ways it's hard. But I will. I've always had a reaction to people saying faceless bureaucrats, or mm -hmm. um, even today, because I do know people who work in the government today who are very committed to the programs that they are mm -hmm. working in, and. Um, and want to do the best that they can. Mm -hmm. um, they may be limited because of the policies of the administration, um, but they're going to try as best they can to make things work for the people that they are supposed to be serving. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I know that that happens, you know, in many places in the government. It's not from the point of view of taking on the administration in, in the way that we did necessarily, although there are, I, I believe that there still are ways, people who do that and end up leaving or being asked to leave mm -hmm. because of their position. So it's not at the level, but I still continue to believe that. Mm -hmm. um, not, not only believe, I know that it's, mm -hmm. it's there because I know people who still work there who I feel are wonderful, committed you know, people. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh...